It's hard to imagine that when you walk around communities like Battle Creek, Marshall, Augusta, Climax, Kalamazoo, that at one time, all of that, all of those communities were wilderness. Now, some of it was marshland, some of it was prairie, and some of it was forest. But wilderness it was. From the arrival of the earliest pioneers in the 1830s to the prosperity of the milling community in the 1860s and 1870s, there was a point when this frontier territory reached a tipping point. When it transitioned from a time of desperate struggle to a thriving community. Here, centered in Battle Creek, there was a boom that happened long before the cereal boom of 1902. In fact, the boom manifested itself across Michigan. The fulcrum was a time between the early 1860s and through the post-Civil War era into the late 1870s. It was a time that could best be described as the golden harvest, a time of industrious farmers and clever inventors that brought Michigan out of the wilderness. So that is what we're going to explore today. So come along and join me. According to Bernice Bryant Lowe in Tales of Battle Creek, the earliest settler on the Godwack Prairie is said to have built his cabin, returned to New York State for the winter, and brought his family back the following spring. However, the cabin was gone, burned. He didn't know that the Indians burned off the prairie each spring. If they were hungry and needed small game for survival, they burned it off one or two more times a year so that sighting their prey was easier. Thereafter, the settlers learned to create a fire break of plowed ground around their homes and planted fields until there were enough neighbors whose cultivation protected the whole prairie. Ecologists today say the Indians maintained the prairies by turning the grasses into ashes whose nutrients were more readily washed into the soil than if the vegetation had rotted each winter. The burning of this natural hayfield kept trees, shrubs, and vines from getting a start. The settlers found the grass roots matted six to eight feet deep. These roots had gradually brought trace elements from far below to stimulate the growth of the grasses to four and five feet above the ground. No wonder the prairies offered the richest soil to the newcomers. And what of you? Even the weariest travelers seemed aware of the prairie's beauty and recalled it years later. There were no pine trees in this region except on the islands of Gogwak Lake. This too may have resulted from the Indian custom of burning among the trees to keep the game visible. Burr oak was the commonest tree in Calhoun County. Its thick bark very resistant to heat. It resembled a pear tree in shape and size. The trees stood far enough apart so that the crops could be grown among them. The burr oak was a workable size too for the pioneer's first log cabin. After felling the trees with an axe, his most essential tool, and making all the other preparations, such as barking and squaring the logs, he told his neighbors, who told their neighbors, Indians included, to come for a cabin raising. The work wasn't light, even with many hands, but a small cabin could be completed in a day. Bernice Bryant Lowe, in her book, recalls the account of a pioneer woman who arrived in 1831 with her husband and baby. They had sold all their furniture and carried nothing but a few trunks and some carpenter's tools and arrived in Michigan. They made a tent out of bushes for walls and two sheets for a roof and they lived in it for three weeks until a house of sorts was ready. She described it as, our tent leaked very badly and our clothes and bedding were often wet but soon dry ride when the sun shone. As for baby, when it rained too hard, we put her under the wash tub until the shower was over. No matter what profession a settler had followed back east, the Michigan pioneer became, first of all, a farmer. He and his family were required to be as self-sufficient as possible. In spite of the strict attention to the maxim, waste not, want not, the early isolated families knew poverty and deprivation. Corn was the first crop and how they wearied of Johnny Cake or Hasty Pudding three times a day. Seat corn was brought from the east 
or obtained from the Indians. Plenty was needed for each hill, according to a folk rhyme. One for the blackbird, one for the crow, one for the cutworm, two to grow. Grinding the corn or the wheat was a major problem before the first grist mills came into operation in 1836. One young pioneer remembered preparing an emergency meal for a shortcake by using the household pepper mill. A local settler heard that seed potatoes were available in the Kalamazoo area and slogged through spring rains for more than 40 miles round trip for a sackful he could carry on his back. A steady diet of wheat bread was a much preferred monotony, but it often took two or three years to clean and cultivate land enough for a wheat crop. So this gives one a snapshot of life for the early pioneers in the 1830s. Wheat would become a major crop new settlers sought to grow. The first grist mill was established by Alonzo Noble and Almond Whitcomb in 1837. It later became owned and operated by J.J. and Ellery Hicks in 1852. This was the beginning of several grist mills in the area for the milling of flour and other types of grain. Along with the grist mills finally being established in the village of Battle Creek, something else happened in the fields north of Climax that same year, which would open new doors for future prosperity. Hiram Moore and John Haskell hitched up a team of 16 horses to haul a new contraption through a wheat field north of Climax, Michigan on July 12, 1836. Believed to be the forerunner of the modern combine and the more celebrated McCormick Reaper, the harvester could cut and thresh up to 20 acres of wheat a day. However, it was so huge it took a team of 16 horses to pull it and its 10 foot high bull wheel and it took a high degree of maneuvering to turn around so it was eventually proved to be quite impractical in its early application. The Virginian Cyrus McCormick had invented a smaller harvester in 1831 and it had its defects of its own but alongside other inventions it offered hope to farmers for a higher yield. Prior to this point in history farmers in the early 19th century required a larger number of laborers to conduct harvesting. The introduction of these types of machines, despite the various problems with the early models, opened the door to higher potential yield for farmers, with less cost for labor in doing so. In 1848, John Nichols opened his own blacksmith shop in Battle Creek. He built his first thresher separator in 1852. The business was successful, so he joined with David Shepard and formed a partnership called Nichols and Shepard and Company. Over the next several decades, they became a major employer in Battle Creek. They manufactured not only the threshing machines, but steam engines, mill gearings, plows, stoves, and also the water wheels for flouring and sawmills. In 1857, they developed the first vibrating separator for the small grain thresher. This is a method that became universally adopted by other thresher manufacturers. They received their patent in 1862. In the 1920s, they developed a successfully functioning corn picker, which also further changed the market. Nichols and Shepard and Company was eventually acquired by the Oliver Farm equipment company in 1929. The Advanced Thresher Company was founded in 1881 with a factory in Battle Creek. In addition to their namesake threshing machines, the company also became a prolific producer of steam engine tractors. It was acquired by the Runley Corporation in 1911. Efficient harvesting became increasingly important as wheat became the primary cash crop of settlers in Michigan. Local flour mills turned out flour, which was shipped east to supply a growing market. Battle Creek became a huge manufacturing center over the years for threshing machines to harvest wheat long before the cereal industry was a primary product. Historian J.H. Brown erected a monument to Moore's threshing machine in the village of Climax. 
All of this was preamble to a major tipping point that was about to take place. It was during a bad winter in the late 1860s. The price of wheat had gone sailing upwards. So the following September, every farmer sowed as much seed of wheat as they could afford on every acre he could cultivate. The result was that there was a bumper crop and a price drop was threatened. So the farmer's magazines advised their readers to carry their wheat over until spring. Spring came and the roads finally thawed and settled enough for travel. There was more wheat stored within 10 miles of Battle Creek than ever before. On one day in May, a great procession of teams of wagons, each loaded down between 16 to 24 bushels of wheat, began to line up near present-day Horrocks at the corner of Fountain Street and Capitol. They continued on down to Michigan Avenue, and then turn left, which was then called Main Street, and up to the corner of where it intersected with Van Buren Street. From there, they crossed the railroad tracks and went over to a grain elevator. Their return trip, they went down Van Buren Street to Division Street and then out of town. According to a historian, J.H. Brown, there were between 500 to 800 loads of wheat that sunny May day from farms chiefly to the south of Battle Creek. Not knowing all their neighbors were of the same mind, the farmers had not planned for lunch themselves or their animals. They didn't think they were gonna be gone that long and they didn't dare get out of the slow moving line. Farmers that day received $3.15 per bushel. $3.15 a bushel was equivalent to about $100 today. Previous prices per bushel was about 40% of that price. The highest the city ever saw and many farmers raised enough wheat on 20 to 40 acres of ground to entirely pay off the land where the wheat was grown. According to another historian, Charles Barnes, who wrote of the incident 40 years later, he said, Battle Creek people today have no conception of the site presented on the wheat buying time in those days. At that time, farmers from Charlotte, Bellevue, Assyria, Hastings, Athens, and Climax brought their wheat to Battle Creek for sale day after day, year after year, during the time of harvest. Between the 1860s to the 1870s, the unusual sight could be seen in the form of 50 to 100 loads of wheat standing in line, waiting for their turn to be unloaded at the mills or at the Michigan Central elevator that stood on the north side of the railroad tracks. It was a time of prosperity for the region many, many years before the cereal boom, which came about almost 40 years later. It could best be described as a golden harvest, not only for the color of the wheat, but the prosperity that it created for almost over two decades. It was akin to a perfect storm where the demand for flour out east was high, the advances in automation from new tools like the thresher increasing productivity and yield for the farmers, good weather, and the infrastructure of mills in Battle Creek. As I mentioned earlier, Nichols and Shepard and & Company and the Advanced Thresher Company were major operations in the manufacturing of farm equipment in the Midwest and the United States. To give you a scale of reference, especially if you're familiar with the Battle Creek area, I thought it would show you the size of their production facilities and where they were located. Here is the Nichols and Shepard plant, which shows up on the 1887 Sanborn fire map and also later on the 1892 Sanborn fire map. It was located where Michigan Avenue and Union Street intersect in present day. Advanced Thresher shows up on the 1892 Sanborn fire map because they came into existence later. They're located where the Grand Trunk Avenue intersects with Kendall Street, which is now the city of Battle Creek's public works across from the fire hub. Both plants were located in close proximity to the railroad and both had a fire station close by. So these two manufacturing companies created their own boom of employment in the region, which was all driven by agriculture. The market for wheat changed in Michigan in the late 1870s, with competition from Western states and Canada supplying the East Market. 
I found references to Michigan using a variety of wheat that was not as popular as some of the other wheat coming from these different parts of the country and Canada. Also corn became a more profitable crop and so wheat production began to die off. The milling industry shifted away from Battle Creek and was replaced by the cereal manufacturing industry over the years. However, it could be said that the bumper crop of the wheat harvest over those decades was the most important tipping point for economic prosperity for the young state of Michigan. Communities like Battle Creek and others across southwest and western Michigan played a vital role in the abundance driven by the agricultural pioneers. But few will ever remember the time of the harvest as an exclusive time of prosperity in the days of the oxen, horses, and wagons lining the streets. In the age before the automobile, it was the time of the golden harvest. It's gonna do it for today's tour through the golden harvest. If you like today's video, please take a minute to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and leave me a comment, tell me what you thought. And if you have a minute, check out my merchandise store down below and support my channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.